An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno Lecture 11, July 1st, 1958 Ladies and gentlemen, before I continue with our discussion of the difficulties which dialectical thinking presents for us, I would like to forestall certain points which I may have presented in an overly crude or cursory um, fashion in the cut and thrust of the argument during the last session. And perhaps a more differentiated account of these things will also prove a further opportunity for me to introduce you rather more deeply to the character of dialectical thinking with regard to a specific problem. I am still talking about the theme of our last session, namely the relationship between the whole and the parts. In the first place, I feel I was probably guilty of some inaccuracy when I referred to the concept of role in order to show how much this concept has effectively and increasingly established itself within contemporary social science, especially under the influence of the theories of the American sociologist Talcott Parsons. In this connection, I said that we could principally and immediately recognize the priority of the whole over the part, above all in that essential part of our life, i.e. in our work, where we essentially feel ourselves as dependent upon society, but not indeed so much as real parts, that is, as beings that are also reliant upon themselves, since we have already been assigned a role by society itself. With regard to this thought, I do not wish to take anything back here, and I certainly stand by it, but it should be said that the term role, as encountered in modern sociology, in contrast to the way it is used in Sartre's Lettre et le néon, for example, is generally meant to signify the opposite, namely the specifically individual form of behavior that we assume in a particular society. But this terminological correction also effectively brings us to a substantive problem. In the last session, as you will probably recall, I said rather drastically that we encounter a kind of priority of the whole over the part in our own experience inasmuch as we perceive social pressure more readily than we do the so-called specific situation in which we find ourselves. And in this connection, I had expressly objected in the inductive logic which prevails in the sciences, according to which we advance from, from particular experiences step by step in a more or less continuous manner until we come to an experience of the whole. Here, too, I would not wish to retreat from the impulse or idea which I have already expressed to you. Nonetheless, I think that the comparison was somewhat misleading insofar as I cannot speak in the strict sense, and the psychologists among you will surely confirm this, of an experience of the whole as a whole without also having an experience of the parts, and vice versa. For neither of these concepts can even be imagined, let alone be thought, without the other. This already furnishes a little model for dialectic. We only really know about the whole as a whole insofar as we perceive or conceptually recognize this whole in relation to parts over against which it presents itself as a whole. And in turn, we also only know about the parts as parts insofar as we are able to relate these parts to a whole such as the visual field, for example. Without this reci reciprocal relation of opposition, the concepts of whole and part simply forfeit their structure or their strict significance. Here, therefore, in a quite elementary sense, you can evaluate the truth of the dialectical claim that categories such as these, which contradict one another, such as the concept of the whole and the concept of the, of the part, are reciprocally mediated by one another. The point I was trying to emphasize for you in our last session, however, could probably be characterized more rigorously and appropriately by saying that what we initially perceive is neither whole nor part, but a sort of third alternative that is extraordinarily difficult to capture in words. This is what my old teacher Cornelius used to describe as a confusion inside a confusion, a concept which is not devoid of a certain objective irony insofar as the concept of confusion already presupposes its opposite. You can see, therefore, just how difficult it is to get any firm hold on what is at issue here. Neither the whole nor the parts are initially perceived as such in an articulated fashion, 
and what we perceive in the first instance is something in general, something antecedent, in a sense, to the distinction of whole and part, whereby the priority of the parts over the whole to which we supposedly rise, as affirmed in the usual logic of science, falls away, as does any dogmatic notion of internally and thoroughly articulated forms, or gestalten, which we are supposed to perceive without any awareness of the parts also being given to us. I should add, in order to avoid misunderstanding, that these fundamental reflections do not specifically relate to the psycho psychological genetic question as to what we first encounter empirically in terms of our sensory apparatus or our psychological processes. Rather, what we are concerned with here is the question of constitutive priority, that is, of whether we must proceed in each case from some first or whole in order to be able to produce meaningful judgments. And as far as this question is concerned, the question regarding the psychological genetic origin of our ideas is not, of course, the absolutely decisive one. But I hope that you can also see for yourselves, on the basis of these reflections, that actually we can no more speak here of a priority of the individual parts than we can speak of a logical priority of the whole. What I should like to discuss here is a difficulty which you may be entirely unaware of as such, but one which makes itself felt all the more tenaciously in the ways all of us tend to think. For even if we are not philosophers, even if we have not been corrupted, as it were, by philosophy, we are still, of course, thoroughly imbued with all kinds of philosophical conceptions, and it is just these conceptions which we unwittingly bring to things, that require critical reflection in order to be rethought or re-articulated, far more so, indeed, than the so-called naive or immediate experiences that we have. This effectively disguised philosophy with which we all grow up, and which is constantly and implicitly knocked into us, as it were, in the course of our scientific and scholarly development, she teaches us that genuinely reliable knowledge is that which derives from some absolute first, uh, first ground or source, quite irrespective of whether this first to which it is ultimately referred is alleged to be an absolute datum, a mere given that cannot supposedly be thought away, or behind which we cannot go, or whether this absolute first is presented as pure thought, as idea, as spirit, or whatever else, which is accorded such absolute priority precisely because it mediates everything particular or individual and constitutes its possibility in the first place. Now, if you consider this thesis of an absolute first, which is also identical with the entire traditional conception of philosophy, and it is no accident here that philosophy is indeed known as prote philosophia, prima philosophia, or first philosophy, and if you reflect explicitly upon the procedures which you employ yourselves in the various areas of scientific knowledge and expertise, I think you will repeatedly discover that you spontaneously believe you do have some such ultimate point of reference as an absolute, reliable, and indubitable criterion of truth at your disposal. But it should be clear that this need to have an ultimate point of, of reference or repair at our disposal is emphatically connected with that need for security with which our knowledge as a whole is intimately bound up. <clears throat> and from a phylogenetic perspective at least, this knowledge is indeed grounded in our attempt to overcome that anxiety in the face of the overwhelming power of nature, which assailed us in archaic times. In this way, we strive to appropriate what confronts us as alien, attempt to make it our own and understand it in a certain sense as part of ourselves. This orientation is still at work in every form of what I call the philosophy of origins, for the immediately given, that is, the facts of our consciousness, to which we appeal as an ultimate point of reference, are indeed precisely always facts of our consciousness, and are supposed, therefore, to, specific, to be specific to us, to be our very own, while spirit or consciousness, as the ultimate legitimating ground of all beings,
is also a conception on our part, and one that effectively represents an ego which has been metaphysically magnified and inflated into a kind of absolute. When we come to consider and evaluate the various basic types of metaphysics, such as materialism and spiritualism, idealism and um, empiricism, or again, idealism and realism, rationalism and empiricism, we may draw certain consequences from this perspective. For wherever some such first, some such absolute or ultimate principle is preferred, we are effectively dealing with idealist thinking, quite irrespective of whether the theories in question present and understand themselves as idealist or exactly the opposite. Thus, this first, to which we refer whatever befalls us, whatever is not ourselves, then it may become our own, becomes such an absolute first, is at the same time always identified with ourselves, irrespective of whether we think this self as an empirical person or as a transcendental form, or eventually, as in the metaphysics of speculative idealism, whether we think of ourselves in terms of absolute spirit. As soon as I provide some such ultimate or original principle, what we actually discover is spirit's claim to exercise power over everything that is. For this ultimate principle is itself always something that has been conceived by spirit, and to that extent, even in dogmatic materialism namely in a materialism which is not dialectical, we shall uncover an idealist moment in so far as it believes it possesses an absolute and original principle from the resources of pure thought. The pathos of dialectical philosophy itself, whatever specific form this philosophy takes, is directed against just such an absolute and original principle. Um, and the greatest challenge, given the intellectual habits with which we have been inculcated, is surely to relinquish this notion, to abandon the idea that we can appeal to such ultimate truth, and to, con and to content ourselves instead with what, for philosophy of origins, must appear and be devalued as something secondary, tertiary, or merely derivative in character. Now this order of evaluation is basically turned on its head by, by dialectical thought, and indeed already by Hegelian thought, even though, as I have often pointed out to you, the ultimate priority of spirit is nonetheless affirmed within the total context of the Hegelian dialectic. One could say, ultimately, that Hegel remains dialectical precisely insofar as he is at once idealist and non-idealist. But just recall for a moment what I have already explained to you about the Hegelian philosophy in a quite different connection, namely that it does not proceed from a single claim, that it does not, for example, equate the starting point itself with which it begins, and which is also variously presented in Hegel's different works, with the truth, that, on the contrary, it sees truth only in the whole, as he puts it, in the process, in terms of its interrelated moments. That it regards the origin or the supposed absolute as actually the poorest and most absurd thing conceivable. If you bear all this in mind, then you will see that the challenge with which dialectic confronts us is actually that of recognizing truth in the process, in the entwinement, in the constellation of moments rather than in an attempted reduction to some such original principle. And this is significant for the position of dialectic in relation to the to the two major currents of philosophical thought with which Hegel found himself confronted and which remain directly relevant for what is described as the contemporary philosophical discussion, however pointless such discussion may often appear to be. For the sake of your own strategic orientation here, as I might almost put it, we can say that dialectic cuts in two directions at once. On the one hand, it works against ontology and, on the other hand, against positivism. And indeed, it creates a specific difficulty for dialectical thought that it cannot comfortably be, accom be accommodated within this currently prevailing, albeit regressive, alternative. <clears throat> 
But first, I think it is necessary for me to take the bull by the horns today and say something more decisive about the position of dialectical thought in relation to ontology, and indeed preferably in Hegel's own words, lest some of you suspect that, as an opponent of the ontological restoration we see around us today, I am just making an arbitrary appeal to Hegel for support here. This is all the more necessary since, at very different points within the ontological currents of contemporary philosophy, we can also observe various attempts to reclaim Hegel as an ontological thinker. Heidegger himself had already announced a similar approach in his early work on Duns, Duns Scotus, which indeed con contains a kind of heartfelt declaration of sympathy with Hegel. And Heidegger's later work, Holtzweig, or Forest Trails, also contains an elaborate and somewhat cautionary interpretation, somewhat reminiscent of the discussion of the two sophists in the Georgists, of the introduction to the phenomenology of spirit, and especially of the title Hegel originally intended for the work, which one critical edition of the book would happily restore. And similarly, in very different places within the reconstruction of Thomistic or scholastic ontology in general, which has been undertaken today, we repeatedly find attempts to incorporate Hegel in some way, attempts which are anything but contemptible, since they clearly betray a dissatisfaction with any static or rigid form of ontology, but which are also extremely difficult to combine with Hegel's own philosophical intentions. It is true that Hegel's philosophy, at least in one work, and perhaps his most impressive, namely the logic, does begin with the concept of being. And it is also true that there is a sense in which we may regard Hegelian philosophy with some justification, since logic and metaphysics are here supposed to be the same as an explication or interpretation of being as a whole, where being is expressly understood dynamically, namely as life. As my friend Herbert Marcuse has tried to show in his book on Hegel and ontology, but I nonetheless believe that such a characterization of Hegel, although it may be correct formality, form, formality, is ultimately incompatible with the essence of Hegelian philosophy, since it would itself, <clears throat> since it would itself inevitably exhibit that character of abstract, abstract, fuck, abstractness. Namely, that form of universality and particularity, which is specifically criticized by Hegelian thought. But I would also like to introduce a terminological observation here, which may prove helpful to you in your own reading of Hegel's texts. For the concept of the abstract in Hegel is by no means restricted to what we generally understand by the term abstract. The abstract in Hegel is not merely that empty universality in contrast to the specific individual contents which go to make it up, although this concept of abstract neck ex fuck abstractness is not absent from Hegel either. And in our next session, we shall read a passage from the phenom Phenomenology of Spirit, where this very concept of abstractness is in question. But if you recall that, for Hegelian philosophy, the merely a conceptual, the this there, which is not yet aware of its own mediation, the tota t, is just as empty and indeterminate as the emptiest and most generic of concepts, then you will understand that the concept of the abstract in Hegel may sometimes signify the very opposite of what it means in ordinary speech, namely that which is merely isolated, which is not yet reflected into itself, where through this reflection into itself, through this unfolding of its own indwelling contradictions, it would know itself in its relation to the whole. The non-conceptual, the isolated particular, which has been arbitrarily broken off, as this forms the content to a considerable degree of the positive sciences, is therefore just as exposed to the verdict of mere abstractness as is the empty universal concept. Thus, the uninitiated and as yet uninstructed reader is confronted with the astonishing paradox that precisely what we are used to regarding as concrete, namely the individual data, the individual facts with which our knowledge begins, 
very often appears as the abstract, whereas the concept in the specifically Hegelian sense, namely in the sense of the particular or individual which comes to comprehend itself, then effectively bears the attribute, attribute of, the, of the concrete. In this sense, it may therefore be said that such a general characterization of being as we have just mentioned, even if this is formally correct, even if we might say that the entire conception of being in Hegel is precisely that of an internally dynamic and indeed internally contradictory totality, is also false insofar as every such isolated proposition, every such isolated claim is itself fake. And what Hegel would fundamentally hold against ontology, any philosophy of being which now believes it possesses the absolute in the concept of being or in being itself, is not the thought that being is indeed a dynamic totality, but, but rather that such a determination of being is one-sided insofar as it remains unfolded, is not rendered explicit. But since for Hegel the explication of concepts the process through which these concepts become conscious of themselves is for its part an element of their own truth, such an abstract determination of being, however correct it may initially appear, however correct in itself it may also be, it is nonetheless inadequate for itself, that is, according to the measure of its own reflection into itself, and thereby precisely false. But this thought, which should not be clear to you after all that we have already discussed, leads in concentrated form to a range of formulations in Hegel, which are so trenchant that we cannot, we cannot fail to recognize the pathos of this philosophy. It is directed against the idea that philosophy should find its absolute in such an abstract, isolated and hypostasized concept as that of being as such. I would just like to offer you a couple of examples, one after another, to show how this critical motif is developed by Hegel in a particularly concentrated way. Thus, at that point in the logic where being is identified with nothing, Hegel writes, in its indeterminate immediacy, it being is equal only to itself. In other words, once being is expressed in its immediacy, it contains no moment, no moment of non-identity. It is pure indeterminateness and emptiness. There is nothing to be intuited in it, if one can speak here of intuition, or it is only this pure, empty intuiting itself, just as little is anything to be thought in it, or it is equally only this empty thing, thinking. Being the indeterminate immediate is, in fact, nothing, and neither more nor less than nothing. But I think I should also add something else here in order to clarify this point. One must always read Hegel in a very differentiated manner, and above all with a constant readiness to think through all the possibilities harbored within a concept, just as Nietzsche later wished his own readers to do. Now you might be tempted to read this passage merely as a logical treatise, as if it meant to say simply that the concept of being, precisely in its complete abstractness and lack of content, in its immediacy, passes over directly into the concept of nothing. As you may see for yourself in any standard manual of philosophy, where the first stage of the Hegelian dialectic is being described. But you would fail to understand this passage properly if you did read it in this way, for the prevailing tone here also gives us to understand that the concept of being itself, if it is deployed without going beyond it, that is, without releasing the process contained within the concept of being itself, is nugatory as a concept, that is, a medium of cognition, or as the ultimate substrata of philosophy. In other words, the assertion that being is nothing bears a double face for Hegel. On the other hand, it signifies precisely what I have just suggested to you. Namely, that the abstractness of the concept of being means that it cannot be distinguished from the concept of nothing, and passes over into its own opposite. That is what you may call the logical metaphysical side of the concept, and the famous claim that Hegelian philosophy is a logic, and metaphysics in one, can perhaps nowhere be better understood than here in this connection. On the other hand, however, you should also bear in mind that a proposition such as being is nothing is also a critical proposition which tells us that, as long as we talk simply about being without actually unfolding the life of this concept in its own meaning, 
then all our talk of being is worth nothing at all, and the absolute we believe we have within our grasp is nothing but a mirage. Again, I have certainly not been reading anything into Hegel here, as I can clearly substantiate with reference to a passage from the encyclopedia, which I shall now read out for you. The point here is to show that what this doctrine represents is less an ontological quality of being than the deficiency of any philosophical thought, which simply terminates in being. Thus, when being is expressed as a predicate of the absolute, this provides the first definition of the latter, namely the absolute beginning as understood by a philosophy which seeks the beginning or first principle, as understood by prima philosophia. Thus the absolute, or that which is utterly first, is being. This is, in the thought, the absolutely first, most abstract, i.e. which still lacks its fulfillment through a process of explication and most impoverished definition. And by specifically introducing the notion of impoverishment at this point, Hegel also clearly shows that he is criticizing the use of the concept of being, however necessary it may be for the subsequent process of dialectical unfolding. That is, he is telling us that he regards a proposition such as the absolute is being as false. But since this proposition provides the very form of a philosophy of origins, which itself necessarily underlies every ontological intention, it also implies a repudiation of the possibility of ontology, of that which today is so often invoked in its name. To conclude, I shall read you another passage from Hegel, one which is expressly directed against Jacobi, whose philosophy of immediate intuition indeed roughly corresponded in his time to the meaning of the philosophies of origins of our time, insofar as the latter are developed from the idea of categorical intuition. And you will see how much this critique of the concept of being amounts, in effect, to a critique of any kind of ontology. Hegel writes, with this totally abstract purity of continuity, that is, with this indeterminateness and emptiness of representation, it is indifferent whether one names this abstraction space, or pure intuition, or pure thought. It is altogether the same as what an Indian calls Brahma, when for years on end, looking only at the tip of his nose, externally motionless and equally unmoved in sensation, representation, fantasy, desire, and so on, he inwardly says only om, 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 or else says nothing at all. This dull, empty consciousness taken as consciousness is just this, being. You will know that it has become common these days to return to the standard orthography of Hegel's time and write sane as sane. So, um, or seen, S-E-I-N as S-E-Y-N, or being as being. So, B-I-N-G as B-E-Y-N-G, and thus effectively to remove the concept from the realm of discursive thought and turn it into a magical word that is precisely meant to designate the absolute in an immediate fashion. There is no doubt, so I am convinced, that Hegel has no other word or expression for this being than precisely om, om, om. That is to say, he would actually see here nothing but a revision to mere mythology, or an abandonment and betrayal of all that Western civilization has effectively struggled to achieve in the course of its conscious development, and any attempt to present Hegelian philosophy as genuinely compatible with, some om, with such om philosophies strikes me only as a sof sophistical attempt to cover one's own questionable maneuvers with the authority of a thinker whose substantial concern is essentially the substance of reason and who is here being harnessed for, the, for philosophical purposes, whose substance is, rather, the renunciation of reason itself. That is all for now regarding the question of Hegel and ontology. But here I should also like to say something about the relationship between Hegel and positivism, and this may perhaps prove the most difficult point to grasp in this context. For if my experience of the cultural and intellectual climate to which the young in particular are exposed today is not entirely mistaken, I believe that a kind of bifurcated thinking prevails, or is at least latently present, among the younger generation in this connection. Thus you may effectively say, well, of course, metaphysics, that basic, that's basically ontology, where there must be some eternal values, or an absolute, 
or an absolute principle of some kind, and if there is no such thing, then we are left with nothing but mere facts. That is to say, there is actually nothing but what the positive sciences ascertain in their methodical way, and anything else must be shunned as illusion. But it is precisely my innermost purpose in these lectures to show you the problem with this alternative. Either metaphysics, on the one hand, and metaphysics amounts to a rigid doctrine of being and of invariant eternal values, or science as an exclusive orientation to what is the case, and tertium non datur, to show you that this rigid alternative is itself the expression of the reified consciousness of today, which demands official documentation for every thought, which requires us to ask of every thought, excuse me, but where exactly do you belong? If you are metaphysical, you must be concerned with being. If you are scientific, you must be concerned with positive facts, and that is that. But this very way of thinking in terms of set and rigidified alternatives seems, seems to me to embody the fateful character of the contemporary state of consciousness in general. In these lectures, I should like, in however modest a fashion, to do my part in breaking the power of this idea in you, in helping you to see that avoiding an orientation to being certainly does not mean falling into an obstinate cult of the scientific facts. Again, on the other hand, when we are overcome by a tedium scientae, when we are no longer satisfied simply with registering facts, we are not necessarily or unconditionally forced to seek nourishment from some preordained metaphysics of being, which is conveniently served up for us. But if you are to work your way through and beyond this alternative, you must resist the conviction that all this is somehow already prepared for you, that these two alternatives are there waiting for you, and you just have to decide for metaphysics or for positivism, rather like choosing between Adenar Ad Ad and Olinar in an election. Rather, you must recognize that this is precisely how reified thought itself, how the power of the administered world, has effectively compelled our own consciousness to think in terms of such pre-given alternatives. And that is why it is so important for us, I believe, to distinguish dialectic just as vigorously from positivism as from that impoverished parody of metaphysics represented by contemporary forms of ontology. But please do not understand this to mean that dialectic is distinguished from positivism, essentially by taking the dish of facts which is served to us by the special sciences and then spicing it up with the sauce of faith, of meaning, of some higher principle. Likewise, it strikes me as a boundless misunderstanding of any consciousness that cannot find nourishment in mere facts to imagine that every thought which goes beyond a mere factum just amounts to saying, well, yes, this all has some kind of meaning. Everything is arranged for the best, and we just have to be satisfied and content with it as it is. On the contrary, what goes beyond mere facticity in the eyes of dialectic, what bestows on dialectic its metaphysical right to life is the very opposite of this. It is precisely the rebellion against the idea that the world of facts to which we have been, been bound and which is utterly meaningless should have the last word in our existence. Dialectic is the attempt precisely in and through the critique of this world of facts which holds sway over us to perceive the possibility of something else without this world of facts itself being in the least transfigured by us in the process. As it turns out, I shall not be able today to explore the relationship between dialectic and positivism in any detail, but I would just like to say to you here today that the difference between dialectical and positivistic thinking should at least be evident to you by now. Dialectical thought is distinguished from positivist thought in that it is anything but natural in character. What I mean is this, if we do think dialectically, this cannot mean that, faced with the temptations of metaphysics, we simply cling instead to a kind of ordinary human common sense, or turn to some kind of self-styled common sense philosophy. It is rather the reverse, and here I come to another challenge, which is posed by dialectical thinking. The challenge of dialectical thinking at this point consists essentially in this. You must cast overboard the established habits of thought with which you are so familiar and take upon yourselves the labor and exertion of the concept. And indeed in this very precise sense, 
that you come to recognize how everything which is given to us so naturally, that we have no doubts about it, is not for its part something natural. For you will recognize it as something already reflected within itself, or expressed in materialist terms, as something which is already socially mediated within itself, and what presents itself to us as nature is thus, in truth, second nature, rather than first nature. Thus, you will recognize that, specifically in order to allow a damaged and oppressed nature what belongs to it, we must not allow ourselves to be blinded precisely by that semblance of naturalness which a rigid world of conventionalized perceptions requires us at every quarter to accept. And in our next session, I shall say something further about this and about the critical intention of thought in contrast to the uncritical and merely accommodating posture of positivism.